particular order, we'll see how things emerge. Um, so just to get us kicked off, um, someone's asked the question, how do you decide what to do when your life is taking you down a path that you know is right for you, however, people close to you want to pull you off that path? I think it's similar to something yesterday someone asked as well, isn't it? Um, well, uh, you just have to stay on it in the sense that um, understand that it will always be like that. There will always be people um, thinking differently to yourself. And, one, and you have to really look at yourself and think, why do I do what I do? And I tell you, we all have the tendency to uh, very quickly comply with what others want us to do. Much easier, makes me look good. Everybody thinks I'm wonderful, and so it's much easier to comply to what other people want you to do. Um, it takes a lot of courage, and it, it takes a lot, of, uh, um, a lot of strength to believe in what you're doing and stay on that course even if others disapprove. And, and remember that they may disapprove of it now, but when they begin to see that it does work for you, they will commend you for what you've done. And not only that, be inspired by you to probably do the same thing that you, you've done as well. So in a sense, you just have to stay with it and, and wait for them to come around, mm. really. So, I mean, an ancillary question, I guess, that that raises in my mind is... Um, it, you know, it's possible to be doing, you know, to, to, to have the desire not to be influenced by what others want you to do, but to be doing that kind of out of a willful, deliberate sort of, no, I'm not going to do what you want to do. So how do you discriminate between doing, you know, how do you really find what is right for you as opposed to just being, you know, like teenagers yeah, get yeah, to this yeah. stage yeah, where yeah. they prove that they are an indiv independent individual by doing the opposite of yes, what their parents want. Absolutely. And yeah. maybe it's only later on that they kind of yeah, come well, into balance. I so. understood from the question that, that the person knew that they were yeah. on the right path. Yeah. So then there is no question about it, yeah. that, uh, that why am I doing it? And it really is to do with this whole aspect of, uh, really cleaning yourself out and knowing that um, w when your life goes in the direction of not only what you want, but when you begin to see that what you do has a positive impact on other people too, mm. that life becomes easier for you and easier for everyone else along the way too. When you're kind of going against the tide, then there's going to be a lot of resistance because of what it is that you're doing, not just because you're different to what they're doing. Mm. And so I think it's really being honest with yourself, being true to yourself, being true with yourself, and knowing that what I'm doing is for genuine reasons and not just for resistance, for the sake of resistance, for the sake of saying... But having said that, I have to tell you that I was telling someone my own story yesterday, and I was saying that when I was first new to this, and um, I was very clear that if I was going to do this in my spiritual life, then it's going to have to be all or nothing, mm. because that's my character. But also I was very aware, we were in a family, my family was very you know, fun and easy and loving and our household was always full with people and guests and visitors and everybody loved coming. And I just knew that if I stayed home, there's no way I was going to continue to do what I was going to do. I was going to be pulled in all sorts of directions. Mm. And then people would say to me, but no, this is not easy. How can you do this? You can't do this. It's not possible to do this. And the more they said that to me, the more determined I became to do what I wanted to do. Mm. But in a sense, um, not just for the sake of opposing it, mm. but really feeling that uh, this is what I want, but am I really going to not do it because everybody's saying it's too hard, don't do it, it's not easy, you're going to regret it. Am I really going to say no by listening to what other Thank people you. are saying, or am I going to say no having tried it myself and then deciding that I don't want to do this? Mm. I'm looking at the back there to see if Kusum Ben's nodding because... Manda's mum sitting over there, so I'm just and checking. And my niece, <laughs> and my niece, <laughs> and your niece over there. Hi. <laughs> Good stuff. So, so here's a, I guess, a related question, which is that 
the person saying, I enjoy exploring spirituality intellectually. Mm. But when it comes to meditation and yoga, I have no self-discipline. Mm. Help. <laughs> I think you're the person to answer that question, <laughs> Jeff, actually, because Jeff, as he said, has been on this journey for 20 years and he was on a left brain journey for a long time yeah. and suddenly had a revelation, didn't you? Or, yeah, well, or not quite suddenly, I but began to realize. Go yeah. on, yeah. <laughs> you well, tell actually, them. <laughs> okay, well, since I'm put on the hot spot, um, my background is, I'm a, I'm a very unlikely person actually to be sitting up here representing the Brahma Kumaris World Spiritual University because my background is uh, pure maths, applied maths, physics, and my degree is in electronic engineering. And so when I came over, yeah, somebody in the front row, see, Institution of Electronic Engineers, I knew there would be another one here. So um, my, my approach to this very much was I was absolutely useless at meditation. Uh, my wife, we both came along together, and my wife just took, took to meditation like a duck to water. But to me... Uh, everything that I did was something that I thought about because that was what I'd been trained to do and that's the side of myself that had been cultivated. You know, Amanda used the term left brain. Um, and so even my meditation was very much in that space. And for me, I had to really get to a point which took a little while, which took me 17 years, a little while, to get to the point <laughs> See what where... See I mean? <laughs> to get to the point where I was... where I realised that that side of the self was so totally full with everything it could possibly be full with, that if I wanted to progress, there had to be a letting go, a letting go of trying to work it out, trying to control it, trying to figure out how it worked. And so that came, well, after 17 years, I realised the need for it. Then after 18 months of literally being... Tearing your hair out. Tearing my hair out, banging my head against the brick wall or whatever... Uh, there was that breakthrough. Uh, but after that breakthrough, there was a whole side of the experience of the self that I had heard about and I'd heard people talking about and I'd witnessed my wife experiencing and had, we'd had interminable conversations about it. But for me, it was until I actually realised that I was filtering, uh, limiting, in intermediating everything in my experience through my thinking so the example would be somebody would say, isn't it a beautiful day? And rather than looking and just having that feeling, yes, it's beautiful, it would be, okay, blue, blue sky, tick, birds, tick, you know, trees, warm weather. Yeah, so there's a kind of computation that when you tick all the boxes equals beautiful day. And a friend of mine who's a therapist said in his experience, and it's not just limited to men, but he said in his experience, 70% of men think their feelings. So they don't actually feel their feelings, they're dissociated from their feelings, and actually everything is intermediated through this thinking kind of side of the self. So if that describes you, you have my sympathy, and <laughs> uh, as I sometimes say, I had a good education, it's taken me years to get over it. <laughs> is that okay? Yeah, it's good. Um, but, you know, for me, um, the kind of meditation that we do here actually is different in that sense that there's a clear understanding of what we are uh, exploring and why. When you come to the meditation course here, to any Brahma Kumari centers, they'll talk to you for an hour and do meditation with you for 15 minutes. And there's a good reason behind that. And that is that, uh, that we need the clarity of understanding for everything, for us to be able to put everything in place. Only then we can say, okay, here we are. All these things are in place. Now I can go inside myself and actually have one thought and begin to explore that one thought. And what I really enjoy myself is, for me, actually probably quite opposite to what Jeff is saying, and that is that if I have to even speak, I can't just sit there and think and think and think and make point lists of points after points. I say, okay, here's something that I need to speak about, and I need to go inside myself and actually have a sense of feeling that what exactly, if you ask me to speak about, let's say, happiness, then I would go inside myself and I think, okay, so when, I, when I'm happy, for whatever, however long it's for, what do I actually feel? What is, what is the feeling that I have? So I will give words and thoughts to my feelings rather than, than feelings to my thoughts. 
And and I think that we all need to explore. It's not just men, although um, Jeff is saying 70% of the men, but I feel that it's probably the case for a lot of us because even women uh, who, who have this intuitive and instinctive side of them, uh, some of them can just sit and have an experience, a spiritual experience, but many of us still need to understand and be clear um, so that we can take ourselves into an experience and a feeling. So I think that when you understand something, it's not so bad, but then you have to say, okay, I understood this now. This is how much I understood. To how can I just sit quietly, peacefully, in silence, and explore what I've understood. I used to do this, especially, I don't do it so much anymore, but I take a spiritual reading, the teachings, and I will literally just sit, sit. I would read a sentence at a time, and I would sit, and I would go into, I, I would begin to explore the feelings and the sentiments behind the language, behind the idea. You have to give time to it. I think you just have to sit and give time to it. Because what happens is that we think, we understand, and we speak, and the confusion, men, women, everybody, the, the, uh, what we delude ourselves about is that when we understand something, we think we are it. Because mm. we so get so good at understanding it, and so good at telling other people about it, somebody's got a problem, I've got a solution to it. And so I'm very good at telling other people about it, but I'm actually not good at putting it into practice myself. But there is that time between understanding, um, articulating it, and then, or before articulating it, exploring it myself, sitting with it, understanding, working with it, and then seeing, well, what is the result that I uh, come, uh, come up with? And throughout the day, actually, Throughout the day, if we can become a bit more self-aware. You know, I, un I, un I uh, learned the understanding of honesty, which I liked very much. That, and that is to be honest means to, that a part of you must always be uh, observing your own self. And we only have glimpses of this in the sense that, you know, I'm sure you've had this experience where you're about to do something and before you do it, you know exactly if you do this, 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 this and this will happen. Or if you do this, this, this and this and this will happen. We've all had the experience of it and we're about to do something and we know we shouldn't be doing it. But we right there and can't help ourselves. And so it's, it's that whereby I can just... Exp just watch myself, and as I observe myself, I stop myself. And, and even if you know, um, even if you give two seconds in between your thoughts and your words, actually, it's a lot of time, because we always think that we have to re re react, not even respond. But you always think that somebody asks a question, I have to be in there with an answer. But can I just stop for a moment? and then give an answer. And that answer would be very different. Or when I'm in a situation and I have to respond to it, or uh, then can I just stop and then think about it for a moment and then respond to it. And this space of silence and, and quiet that actually comes is very powerful, mm. extremely powerful. Mm. It's that that shifts, you know, and there's someone that, Doug is often joking about this. He'll tell me something. He'll say, okay, here's this idea. What do you think about this? I'll wait. I, I, have to, I, I used to say to him, okay, it has to go from here to here. Then I'll give you an answer. So now I don't have to tell him that. He'll say, here it is. Let it go from here to here and then tell me. <laughs> so, and it's not instant. Always. It may be time. A week, mm -hmm. two weeks, a year. Yeah. It could be anything. If it's big issues, you just have to wait mm -hmm. and let it just filter through. Kind of sit with it. Sit with it. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. We we kind of um, touched on this a moment ago, but the question here, you know, how do you how do you deal with really controlling people? You know. 
Yes, the uh, lady. Especially yeah. when they can't see how much damage they do. Yeah. The lady asked me, actually, because she wanted to go off and she was going to be late. But since it's come up now, I'll answer it. What I was saying to her, she was describing the situation to me. And I was saying to her is that, and she said, I know about the love thing and this and that. <laughs> and I've been doing this for 20 years now. But I said, well, if it's been 20 years, you just have to do it now. Mm. It, not just that I know what to do, do it. Mm. And And... If you want to influence a change in someone, then you have to stop being influenced by them. You have to stop being influenced by what they are and how they are. That's one thing. And the other thing is that uh, you have to stop wanting them to be how you want them to be. No matter how right you are. No matter how good you are. Mm. Or how what you're saying is good for other people. And so in a sense, what I'm really saying is make peace with that person for what they are. Mm. And then actually in that kind of a relationship, you would be able to have an inroad or some door would start to open and you can begin to either have a conversation with them or you begin to have love for them that you, they can sense without you pushing mm. your way through um, uh, with that anytime no matter who they are and what they are and how bad inverted commas they are but if I'm forcing someone to be anything other than what they are it is never going to work mm. never ever going to work and I know from previous conversations with you that you're talking from your own experience yeah. of running this place and starting off in that place where there's the temptation to yeah. be a bit more forceful and yeah uh, yeah, yeah. Always, in a sense, you know, I'd have a foresight about something and I'd think, well, we're going from here to there and this is it. This is how you go there. But not everybody's ready for that. Mm. And so I could have, I would have had the tendency to just say, but see this, this is how it is and it could be like this. And then I had to back off and say, okay, you walk the journey. And six months later, they'll come to me and say, you were right. This is what we should have done then. <laughs> but that's okay. That's my lesson. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it's happened so many times. Six months later, we're backtracking. Mm -hmm. But that's the way it is. Yeah. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. It has to be. Yeah. It's certainly much more okay now than it was 20 much years ago. Much more okay now <laughs> than it was then. <laughs> Not just 20 years ago, maybe five years ago. <laughs> yeah. So here's another question. I, I've met a few very special spiritual teachers on different paths. How do I choose my teacher and my path? Well, I think again that uh, it's this thing of where you feel that um, everything is in harmony um, with that. If there's slightest bit of a feeling of discomfort in any way, then you have to go back to the drawing board again. Um, in that uh, I was saying to someone yesterday, I think it was in our conversation again, in that, you know, when you find the right path, then everything comes together in the sense that your ideas, your thoughts, your feelings, the vibration and the energy, every feel, everything feels comfortable. But it cannot be an intellectual thing. Um, and what I mean by that is that sometimes you have the habit of exploring mm -hmm. and we never trust ourselves to to for something to work. So it's, you know, dabble in this and a dabble in that and a dabble in that. Because of that tendency in itself, um, it prevents me from experiencing the absolute beauty of something. Mm. And so I have to give it my all. I have to give it my all and then say, okay, this doesn't work for me. Mm. Um, instead of trying, or if I try 10 things at the same time, none of it is going to going to give me fulfillment mm. try one thing at a time and don't think that well i'm trying this for one month and there's something else after that one month and so waiting for someone else something else to come along it, it's a tendency the habit that we've developed whereby the habit of dissatisfaction discontentment and lack of trust and faith Mm -hmm. And I don't mean faith in, as in a religious type of faith. I mean faith in, you know, a part of us always knows the inevitability of what we don't know. Say that again? Inevitability of what we don't know or inevitability of what we don't know now. 
or inevitability of what our eyes don't see and we can't sense in this moment. Because the spirit, the soul is, you know, it's not confined to space and time. Actually, the past is the journey that I've been on already. But in a sense, the future journey, the soul will already know its journey. Mm. It's just that when I'm here in the physical with matter, matter is very limiting. It's limiting. You know, I can feel and touch only this. But in a sense, spiritually, I can, I can sense actually this whole energy in this park right now. And, and it's possible for us to know our, in our own personal journey what is to come in the future. Mm. If we can stop living in the past, because my sense is that most of us probably live 90% of the time in the past. Even if I'm not consciously living in the past, subconsciously, unconsciously living in the past on the basis of my past experiences, my past perceptions, my, my, uh, my, my victories or my defeats, whatever. When I in allow that to influence me in the present, actually, I've limited myself hugely. And so, in a sense, I'm not exploring the present. Forget about the future. Yeah. Knowing that I can take charge of my future, I'm locked in a space in a, inside my own head. So, we all have the ability, if we can be free from the past, and this is where meditation comes in, mm. in the sense that we know meditation is a practice where you can just, you can make time stand still for you. You can make the world stop for you. Mm. And when you learn the ability to do that through silence and reflection and self-awareness and a connection with the divine, then, then actually when the world stops for you, in a sense, the world stops influencing you, then you can start saying, here is where I'm going now. Here's where I sense I need to go now mm. because I'm cleaning myself of the past and I'm not bombarding myself with what I think the world expects me and everybody else expects me to do. Mm. And so, you know, the future is a, a clean slate. Mm. I clean the slate. Nobody else cleans the slate for me. Nothing is written there until I write it because the future is a clean canvas. Who knows what the future holds? So you're saying, in effect, that the story we tell ourselves based on our experiences from the past, we have to be able to, you know, put that to one yeah, side and yeah. just say, right, from now on, right. it can, everything can be totally different. Totally different. It, and it's, to and it's not the, that I'm denying or ignoring. I know that it's there and I know that it can influence me, but I'm taking time to put it aside in order to cultivate this experience of of freedom and cleanliness and uh, truth and purity, if you like, of my consciousness, so that I can use that then to paint a picture for myself for the future. Mm. Which actually, this amazingly, the, the one I've got on the top here is, how do I connect with the predictive power I have within me? Mm. No. This is it. Mm. Very simple. Really very, very simple. I think, and, and again, this left brain and this complicated world of ours that has trapped our, us in the expansion and the variety of, that exists, um, the simplicity we find difficult. Mm. The lack of complications in spirituality we find hard to fathom. Mm. So, you know, we can only feel accomplished when we can, you know, make, make unravel things and analyze things and you know, uh, feel that we've achieved something. But actually, mm. it's very simple. What we want to achieve is already there mm. for us to explore. That actually reminds me, I was in a program in um, London, in the main BK Centre in London a couple of years ago now, and there's a woman in the audience, and she asked the speaker, there was a panel of speakers, she asked the speaker, she said, I've read all these self-help books, you know, I've read uh, Eckhart Tolle, I've read Stephen Covey, I've written, you know, all these gurus of the modern age she said but nothing's really changed in my life she said you know what, what, what am I doing wrong and he said well you know the thing is that uh, you don't need to read lots and lots of books just find something that resonates yes. with you and actually yeah. put it into practice he said because otherwise he said you're not really doing self-development all you're doing is shelf development 
<laughs> which I thought yeah, was a great line perfect you know, yeah you know, great and, and this is exactly well. what I meant when I said earlier on is that we seek we feel that the, in the seeking is the achieving yeah. in a sense where we keep seeking and we feel great because we're learning so much you know we, we're, we're accumulating all these experiences and we think wow my life is so rich and it is rich with ideas and concepts of many other people's experiences. But what about my own? Yeah. And I can only take myself into experience when I can clean all of that out and put it on one side and say, what do I know? Mm. What do I understand? And we were talking about this yesterday, this, uh, that, you know, actually, we know everything. Mm. And I don't mean that from a place of arrogance. And I mean that in we know everything intuitively and instinctively. And it's just that when we come to places like this in an atmosphere of safety and, and warmth and openness, then actually we can, we can emerge the wisdom that's latent inside of us. Everybody, why are we doing this? Why do we do this? We're doing this so that people can do this for, my, for themselves. You know, you can go to people and find all these gurus. Your gurus will do something for you for a very short period of time unless and until you become your own guru and teach your own self what you have to do. You can be seeking for the rest of your life and you'll have gurus after gurus. But Yeah, actually... I <coughs> Again, because you encouraged me to reveal a little bit of my journey, I can remember actually turning to my wife on many occasions and asking her this question. I'd say, I'm going to ask you a very silly question because we've been on the path together for like 10 years, 15 years. How do you meditate? And uh, there were two answers that she gave me. Just that like really, that. You know? <laughs> no, no, the first answer was, there isn't a how, you just do. Yeah. Right, And that really irritated me because for an engineer, there's always a how, you know, you do this and then this and this and this. And, this. and so that was a real, you know, I thought that was the most stupid sentence anyone had ever constructed <laughs> in the history of the language. There isn't a how, you just do. Um, but the other thing was, I said to her, I really have difficulty with this meditation. She said, well, the reason for that is, she said, you're the kind of person who, if you feel you can't meditate, the last thing that you do is sit down and do some meditation. The first thing you do is you go onto Amazon and find out what's the best-selling book on meditation and get, you know, download it to your Kindle or whatever it is. And so I just share that because there might be one or two of you in the audience who, I'm sure you wouldn't do that, but you, <laughs> might, you might know someone who would and uh, therefore it might be helpful for them. Mm. Okay, so here's a question. What's the best way for me to finish my karmic account with you? With uh, me? Well, I mean, you know. With anybody. I suppose with anybody <laughs> in the general sense. Sorry, could you yeah, what's the, what is the best way for me to finish my karmic account with you? And maybe you could say a few words about karmic account and what that might mean. Karmic account in a sense. Um, anybody doesn't know what karmic accounts are? You don't know. You don't know. What, um, well, this, this philosophy, this spiritual law, if you like, that as you sow, so shall you uh, reap, right? It's a concept that it mentioned, is mentioned in the Bible also. And what that really means is that we are constantly engaged in action and interaction with people. And the, quali the, the way in which you uh, interact with others or the actions that you perform will always bring you back results that is... That is the payback. Yeah, the payback, what you do. In, and what that really means that if you, say, give pleasure and joy and happiness to others, that's what others will give back to you. And if you give pain and sorrow to someone, then that's what's going to come back to you. And over a period of time, and, and period of time means not in, in a lifespan of 50, 20 years, but in etern well, not quite eternity, but in a lifespan of a time whereby where we as human beings come into this cycle of birth and rebirth, we accumulate this 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 account if you like because it doesn't get you know money is easy put your hand in your pocket somebody gives you 20 pounds you can give 20 pounds back to them and that's much easy to quantify but this this feelings these experiences are not so easy to quantify and therefore it it's it's an ongoing process and journey that continues that it's the only thing you carry with you in india we have this notion that you come alone and you go alone the only thing that comes with you is the quality or the influence of the quality of the actions that you performed. 
It's the only thing that goes with you. And with you means with you as in when you move on from one life to another. So it's this aspect of karma. And so karma is one particular, this now, here and now, instant re repercussions or karma that takes time over a period of time. It could be 10 years, 20 years, or it could be lifetime. So this is what we're referring to when we say karma. And so, you know, and therefore, I'm sure you've had this experience whereby, uh, whereby you know, you meet people and it's like there's an instant affinity with them, as if you know them, you know, you don't know, not necessarily the face, although it feels like it's the face that you recognize, but it's not the face, but there's some kind of an understanding and a rapport with someone and you think, you're sure you know that person. Where does it come from? Or you meet someone and you think, oh my God, no. It's like there's another kind of knowing that happens there where you don't really want to meet them at all. You don't want to know them. And these are all things, in a sense, that are residues of unfinished business with other people from the past. And so, so this is many, many things. This is in terms of relationships, in terms of my own physical body. You know, I also believe that, you know, if, you're, if you suffer in your body, then it's also because you've... Um, how have you used your body? It's also to do with the environment and nature and element elements. We're complaining about the elements in our world today. Well, what, what created the ozone layer? What's created this abuse of matter that exists in, in our world and therefore the scarcity of resources? It's because we as human beings have abused these these elements so you know in a sense all of these things occur so when we're talking about karma it's all of these things put together so my life in a sense is really big sack of karmic situations if you like and so uh, for me in order to so it's a big one what comes first the chicken or the egg and so i don't know at this time which action is a ripple sure. and which action is a new action that I'm performing which will create the repercussions in the future. It's, it's a very intricate web now. And so it's not a question of unraveling it thread by thread because it's not possible to do it. But what you can do is you say, okay. You know, we also have a saying in India, the, mo the time you wake up is the time is, that's morning for you. That's your morning. And so in a sense, if I wake up now and I begin to realize that I'm suffering so much now, must be something. And it's not that you're condemned to your karma. This is the concept that also exists with karma. When people understand karma, they think, oh my God, I'm condemned to my karma. I must have been such a bad person that I'm suffering so much. But it's not about that. It's about saying, okay, so here I am going through this it's probably, it's pretty much likely that it's as a result of something else from the past. I can't change the past, but I can look at what I'm going through differently in order, order to manage it differently. You can just see the pressure of it is relieved. It's this, this same thing again, wanting something to be other than what it is. Mm. The moment I do that, I actually make the situation more difficult and harder to deal with. You know, if you have a pain even, I, again, I don't know where I was saying this yesterday or somewhere else, there's a big difference between pain and suffering. Pain is, is mandatory. But suffering is optional. Suffering is optional in the sense that, um, or pain is mandatory if, if, you know, there is discomfort. If something in your body is not working, then you're going to experience pain. And you're, you can't do anything about that instantly. But the suffering of that pain is when you've exaggerated it in your mind so much thinking about it and talking about it, going to practitioners after practitioners and nothing has worked and it's become such a big deal for you now that it's like you're suffering with it. You're really suffering with it. But, you know, okay, so I have this pain. Can I really make peace with it and begin to explore things one by one in order to deal with it? I'm much more calm, much more peaceful. So if I'm going to deal with my karma again, 
on all levels, on any level, I say, okay, here I am today, and this is my story today. And what am I going to do about it today? It's not that, you know, I was such a bad person before. I may have been, but it doesn't matter now. It's done, it's dusted, and it's finished. But now I have a choice in how I'm going to deal with this. And now I have the opportunity to take the right help from the right people in the right way to begin to change that. And who can do that for me? Only I can do that. Nobody else can do that for me. I can go to practitioners after practitioners or practitioners or doctors after doctors. They can only give me the medication, but I have to take the medication myself. And here, the medita medication that we're talking about is taking time, really taking time to sit still, to get some wisdom down my throat so that I can begin to throw some light on the matter and begin to not just, you know, be working intuitively and instinctively, but also clarity and understanding. And for me, karma does this. Karma, the philosophy of karma makes me understand. So then I can say, I get this. I get this. So now I have to give time to building power and strength within myself with peace and silence and and, and a connection with the divine, which is the one unchanging and unconditional force in our universe that, or even beyond our universe, that can help us be so stable and still inside and provide that positive energy that I can use to work with myself. Mm. Which has brought us to just a couple of minutes before time and uh, is probably... You, know, you didn't actually make the pun that uh, the medication is the meditation. The meditation, yes. But uh, it was clearly that you were headed that way. Um, would you like to spend the last couple of minutes just giving us some hmm. guidelines, some experience of how we might do that in practice? So the meditation that we practice here is very, very simple. And because it's simple also, and because it doesn't have the one, two, three, four, five steps, well, each one creates can create their own. There are basic steps of just stepping back and being centered inside and then going on a journey through your own thoughts. But we meditate with eyes open simply because meditation is a very natural thing. It's not something that you have to force yourself for or, you know, uh, um, become oblivious to what's going on around you and then try and be something or do something. But here we are in this place there are thousands of people here today. Lots of things are happening. People are walking by. You can hear someone speaking over there, children screaming, all of that. And if this is going to distract you anywhere, not just here, anywhere, then we're not in connection with life, right? Life is, this is life. There are others, there are people, there are sounds, there are scenes. Everything is around us. And part of understanding for me is that it's okay that it's there. There are always going to be babies crying. There are always going to be people talking. But can I just say it's okay that they're there. They do exist in our world. And they have their place. So it's okay. But I can either go to that baby. Why is that baby crying? Why doesn't the mother do something about it? That mother's dis that baby's distracting me, or I can just say, it's okay. It's okay. And I am going to go in my own exploration inside myself. And that's why meditation, the practice here, is a very natural one in that way. Everything is okay. Babies, other people speaking, other people walking and chatting is okay. Everything is okay. And then I take myself on an exploration. And the basic understanding of this exploration that I am a spiritual being whose original nature is that of peace, of love, of purity and truth. I am that. I'm always that. And so this is what I meant by this wiping of the slate clean. And as I do this, it's not hours and hours, moment by moment. It doesn't matter a few seconds at a time. It doesn't matter when those seconds build into a minute 
And it, that builds into five minutes. It's okay. Whenever I can take those minutes, let me go inside myself. So let's just explore this. Sit still and comfortably, but relaxed, but alert. Because often when we're too relaxed, it can kind of we go into the land of nod. And um, that's not meditation. Sometimes people will fall asleep or nod off and will say, I had a really nice meditation. <laughs> but relaxation is very different to meditation. Relaxation is one thing and perfectly fine. And we have a lounge over there. You can go and sit and relax there. You can doze off there. That's not a problem. But when you meditate, actually, you become alert. You become spiritually alert so that you become energized. So relax your eyes in one place. If you have your own practice and you want to close your eyes, that's fine too. But as a continuous practice, it's, it's always very beneficial. Become conscious of yourself sitting here in this chair. And go inside yourself and look at yourself in the screen of your mind. This mind really is an energy of thoughts. An energy that I can direct whenever and however I choose. One thought of peace is a thought that creates an energy that runs through my entire physical body. And I become aware of that energy of peace, not only inside of me, but around me. But it's not just peace, where there is absence of sound but a peace in which there is total happiness and harmony inside myself. And it's as if I find myself into a deep well. A deep, deep well of that stillness and actually I am this stillness and in this stillness I am conscious that I am this pure divine energy deep energy of beauty and it is this that allows me to be at peace with everything around me. And therefore, I'm able to be in a state of absolute love. And this love is who I am and what I am. And it is with this love that I can also connect with the higher power, this unchanging, unconditional, vast energy of love and peace. The one energy that never ever changes or never ever lets me down. And as I keep making a connection with that, The same that is inside me emerges even more profoundly because I am love, I am peace. And it is through this that any other experience of the past dissolves into nothingness and I'm able to stay centered inside myself. And this is a place 
a sanctity, if you like, a sacred place inside my heart and my mind that I travel to many times in the day for as long as I choose, as long as I choose, as many times as I choose. And this vibration becomes my vibration. It's what I reflect through my eyes, my words and my vibrations. Om Shanti. I am the essence of peace. Thank you.